Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to a special edition of We Are SC's Inside the Trojan Subtle. Our panel's look this week at the best offensive players, position by position, of the modern football era of USC, and also the best and worst USC coach. And a reminder, Inside the Trojan's Huddle is a game-like panel discussion with We Are SC colonists and staff writers. We start with the pregame show where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojan Huddle and give you the latest USC Trojans football news. First, however, let's meet this week's panelists. Mark Culkin, We Are SC columnist who writes the Monday Morass, Yay or Nay, Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season practice reports. Chris Arledge, former William Jewell College DB and team captain, and We Are SC columnist who writes the popular column, Musings with Arledge. Greg Katz, that's me, your host and moderator of Inside the Trojan Huddle, and a weekly We Are SC columnist who writes the obvious and not so obvious in the IMHO Sunday. Before we kick off our special offensive all-time edition, here is the latest USC football news. On Saturday, Trojans head football coach Lincoln Riley got the attention of USC's fandom when the coach used his Twitter account to display the two-fingered yellow fight on icon, which generally signals the past, uh, something is going to important going to have about to break uh, publicly. We haven't seen anything yet, uh, but many believe the icon could be the precursor to another recruiting commitment or a transfer commitment. Speaking of recruiting, the Trojans coaches are currently in a recruiting dead period which lasts through February 28th, meaning no official or unofficial campus visits. Coaches can, however, make recruiting contact through social media. And as USC's Lincoln Riley continues to rebuild USC's football program with the goal of setting and getting USC into the college football playoffs sooner rather than later, it was announced last week that the postseason college football playoff will likely remain a 14 playoff through the end of its current 12-year contract which means through the 2025 season. This is not a favorable announcement for the Pac-12, which was hoping to gain admittance to the playoffs with its conference champion. And finally, at the world champion Los Angeles Rams victory celebration uh, and parade and program last week, former Trojans All-America wide receiver Robert Woods, who was out for much of the Rams season due to ACL injury and surgery, told onlookers in a large TV audience in Los Angeles that being at the Coliseum was important to him because USC and the Collie are where he continued his football education for a successful playing career in the NFL. And finally, friends, we are SC's Inside the Trojans Huddle. Greatly appreciates your viewership and listenership. We appreciate and encourage those of you watching sites like YouTube to click on the red subscriber button and put a like for us. It's greatly appreciated. And the best part is it's all free. All right, here we go. It's time for the opening kickoff and our first quarter question of this special Inside the Trojan Huddle Edition. And we begin with a head coaching question. Panel, in your opinion, who is the greatest head football coach of the modern USC football era and the worst head coach of the modern football era? And for all questions this week and next, when we define modern era, we're talking about from 1950 to the president. So our leadoff hitter, as usual, the great Mark Culkin. So Mark, why don't you lead us first and tell us who is the greatest coach in your opinion of in USC modern football history and who is the worst? Hmm. Yeah, uh, there's so many coaches. Well, there's not really that many, but I've got three of my that are going to that I'll qualify as the greatest. And then I'm going to, you guys are going to have to help me figure out which one actually is the greatest. So you've got John Robinson. Um, he's undefeated in the Rose Bowl, 4 0, and he was 7 and 1 in bowl games. Uh, he's credited with one national championship. And the argument could be made that he, his teams could have had two more. So uh, I think what 76 and 79, they finished number two in the country. Um, so those were two years, you know, that an argument can be that USC might've had a national championship uh, with him as their head coach, John McKay, you know, that's more of your era, Greg. I kind of came in with McKay 
as I was coming off the teat. So all I know is his stats and all of his accolades, which are, they speak for themselves. So um, then there's, you know, P. Carroll. And I think that's where everyone's going to kind of gravitate to just because when John Robinson and McKay were doing it, um, you know, TV and cable, you, you had pretty much one game per week or two games, if you're lucky, that you got to watch on TV. Pete Carroll's doing it in the era of you watch it, you can watch a game whenever you want, whether it's on TV or not, because you can stream it. So I'm thinking about, you know, what he put together and hit during his tenure. And if his tenure took place during the playoffs, who knows where that Pete Carroll dynasty would have led. So I'm going to lead um, towards Pete Carroll just because I'm thinking 34, you know, consec- 34 consecutive, consecutive games won. The Heismans, um, the way they just dominated out of conference, the way they won their bowl games, um, save for that, you know, one loss here or there that you just kind of left your head scratching against an, an Oregon State or whatever. There's not a lot to complain about during his his time as a head coach. So as far as greatness, he's probably I'm going to go Pete Carroll, John Robinson, McKay. In that order. In that order. Okay. And then as far as the worst, um, I'm going to give Paul Hackett that 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 feather in the cap, only because at least Clay Helton he tried different things. He tried to reinvent himself. He tried to reinvent USC in, different, in his own vision. It didn't work. So you give credit to a guy who tries. Um, as far as I remember from Paul Hackett, he had his playbook. He was the genius. He had his bottle when practice wasn't working well. And that was the Paul Hackett era. All right. So in order to make, make sure we all get this straight, you think that Paul Hackett was the worst of the modern era, correct? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Well, yeah. now it's time to turn our attention to, well, let's clear something up before I get to with Chris. Contrary to popular belief, Chris and I do not hate each other. Chris and I are not going to do a Luce Libra for paid television. Uh, wait wait a minute. If the price is right, we <laughs> I'll tell you right now, for the right dollars, we would fight. Uh I mean, you know, I'm kind of from the '60s. Peace and freedom, love ends, uh, and everything. You would, you would probably pin me. You would probably pin me by just looking at me. But no, we're 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 good friends. And uh, those of you that would like to stir the pot, uh, uh, we're you know we're we're Trojans. Trojans stick together, right? Through through. All right, let's let's stop with the flower crap. Let's get right to the meat of the matter. Chris, who's the greatest USC football coach in the modern era? And then tell us who you think is the worst. Yeah, I, I th- unlike Mark, I think there are two candidates, not three. John Robinson was an excellent football coach. He belongs in the College Football Hall of Fame. He was a good NFL coach, too. But Robinson took over an established program. Um, and, and I think there was some drop-off at the end. He didn't, he didn't create a program. McKay and, and Carol both did that. In choosing between the two, um, Obviously, McKay had more longevity, so he had more national titles. He had more um, uh, he had more conference titles, although barely actually uh, than than Carroll did. But I'm going to give Carroll the nod for two reasons. One is consistency. Carroll's seven year run of finishing in the top four every year is something that McKay didn't do. McKay had a, a, a lot of fantastic years, but he also had um, he also had quite a few uh, three and four loss years sprinkled uh, sprinkled in. Um, not that, not that that's a problem. He, he's, he's a, he's on the Mount Rushmore for a reason, but the other reason is I think Carroll lifted USC above every other program in college football. I'm not sure that McKay did. There's no question that USC was one of the two, three or four elite programs at the time, but Ohio state, Oklahoma, Notre Dame, Alabama, uh, you could argue were all at the same level as USC during McKay's tenure. You cannot argue that any other program was at the same level of, uh, as USC, at least for the bulk of Carroll's tenure. Maybe Urban Meyer at the end with Florida um, uh, rose to the same level. 
But, um, but no, Pete put USC in a special place where USC was not just the, the elite program in college football, but was almost, uh, almost uh, at the same level as the Lakers uh, in Los Angeles, which is amazing. I don't think that uh, I don't think that McKay could make that claim. So I'm going to give it to Pete, although it's close because both guys are are fantastic. Uh, worst coach, Mark is right. Mark is right. And listen, my anti Clay Helton qualifications are second to none. Anybody who reads my <laughs> column knows that Clay Helton was Clay Helton was uh, completely unequipped to be the head coach of a major college football program. That being said. Paul Hackett was, was horrific. And there's one moment in particular, you guys may remember this, USC's playing Cal at the Coliseum, down by, it was probably four or five. We needed more than a field goal, but a touchdown would have won it. USC needs to get the ball back. Cal has a fourth and four. And so, and so Hackett, has, Hackett has a punt return team on the field. Then he gets nervous because he's afraid Cal may go for it. And so, and so he sends a defense out and there are 22 guys run around on the field. So Hackett calls a timeout, Burns, Burns a critical timeout because USC, USC is going to need to go the length of the field to score. Burns a critical timeout, USC's last time. Sends the punt return team back on the field after the timeout. Again, gets nervous that Cal may go for it and again sends the defense back on the field. So you get up 22 guys this time he doesn't have the timeout. USC is flagged for having all of those guys on the field. Fourth and four becomes first and 10. USC doesn't get the ball back. That was the perfect encapsulation of Paul Hackett. Paul Hackett had more football knowledge than Clay Helton. In terms of X's and O's, no NFL team is ever going to hire Clay Helton to be, to be an offensive coordinator. I'm not sure a high school team should hire Clay Helton to be an offensive coordinator. Paul Hackett was a legitimate offensive coordinator in the NFL. He had more X's and O's knowledge than Clay Helton, but the level of dysfunction and disorganization in his program was shocking. And the reality is that, that Tolmer won a Rose Bowl. Um, Helton won a Rose Bowl. Hackett could have been at USC for 87 years and he would not have won a Rose Bowl. He's the worst coach in USC football history. All right. So let's make sure we got this straight now because I don't want any misconceptions. Uh, so, Chris, you're basically saying, and of course, I refer to Chris now in great reverence. I call him the white mamba for a reason. Uh, uh, you're basically saying that Pete Carroll is the best, in your opinion, for, and that Paul Hackett is the worst. That's right. Okay. Well, now it's my turn to sit there and say you're both absolutely wrong and you're showing your youth and it's embarrassing to be quite <laughs> frank with you. Yeah. Uh, I who think who both... knew which direction Greg was going to go with this one? Well, you know, Mark, uh, you know, it, I couldn't understand one of the things you said earlier about uh, you were just out of the teats or something. I, I was know. just off the teat. Oh, the well, I don't even want to even go there on that one, but uh, I'll leave that to the imagination of other people. But let me tell you something. There's a real disadvantage to be about being old. Okay. Uh, I'm 17 years old reversed. Uh, and I have lived through all the eras. And so uh, I don't know if I'll be living through the next one, but I'm going to go with this to destroy both of what you were saying. Uh, first of all, John McKay, hands down, is the greatest USC football coach of the modern era for a number of obvious and not so obvious, shameless plug, uh, reasons. First of all, he won four national titles. He didn't blow any national titles like Pete Carroll did uh, against Texas. Uh, Pete Carroll's the one who allowed Lane Kiffin to be the offensive coordinator. Uh, so the buck stops with Carroll on that. Uh, and of course, uh, we know that uh, McKay, uh, with those four national titles, uh, uh, brought himself into the College Football Hall of Fame. Now, Pete Carroll versus John. Well, first of all, let's get let me get, let me do this right. John Robinson isn't even in the discussion. Okay, he inherited a great program from John McKay. When uh, John Robinson's first game, he got annihilated by Missouri, and I was there. That doesn't mean he's not deserving of conversation, but John Robinson. 
uh, used the wave of John McKay to power himself through the late 70s into the very early 80s, left USC, really not as in good a shape as he found it, as we know that there was recruiting violations uh, at the end of the situation that really screwed everything up. Now, as far as Pete Carroll uh, and John McKay, Pete Carroll, John McKay was royalty. Okay, he was royalty. Pete Carroll was celebrity. Okay, John McKay faced UCLA when UCLA was very strong. And Notre Dame was very strong. Now, Pete Carroll had a very good record against Notre Dame. Uh, Pete Carroll, Pete Carroll had, had a very good record against everybody, Greg. And that's the point. Okay, they both had very, very good rate. This, that's not even debatable, but that was a good try on your part, uh, Arledge. Um, John McKay's record was 127 and 40 and eight. Look, those are eight ties that could have been wins in an overtime. He had a 749 winning percentage, played in eight Rose Bowls, one Liberty Bowl. And I think what's really important to me, and uh, this is debatable, this is just a personal opinion. Uh, John McKay left USC in good shape when he left. Pete Carroll did not leave USC in good shape because we know by the NCA sanctions that uh, Pete Carroll, you can argue this all you want. I'm going to. No, I, me too. I, I would be disappointed if you didn't. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, I honestly, my personal opinion is I think Pete Carroll, who was incredibly hands-on and autocratic, <laughs> knew exactly what was going down. Uh, no, he's not been accused in a court of law, and Chris would point that out. But I think that uh, Pete Carroll, uh, uh, I, I think that Pete Carroll was not as disciplined. I think his coaching staff at the beginning of Pete Carroll's era was immaculate. I have no problem. But any coach that gets rid of Norm Chow, in my opinion, because it was petty jealousy. Uh, is not in the upper uh, echelon. Now, John McKay never lost uh, great coaches like that. He didn't hire bad coaches. He was the consummate head coach, in my opinion. So I'm also going to take exception with both of you. There is no doubt in my mind, none. And I knew both guys. Uh, Clay Helton was the worst of the worst. At least Paul, Ma Paul Hackett, even though I don't think he had great people skills, he knew football. He had a system. He graded on people's nerves. I get that. I don't think he was a great leader. I don't think that Clay Helton, for all the reasons that Chris said, uh, are totally legitimate and then some. Uh, Clay Helton, under any other, if he, Clay Helton had been through the John McKay era with Dr. Norman Topping and some of the other ones, he would have never lasted after three seasons. It would be over. And the fact, it's not his fault that he stayed uh, as the head coach. It was the administration's part. But Chris, in all fairness, I, I'm going to give you time to re respond to my... Um, well, I'm going to jump in before Chris goes. So. Now, now, wait a minute, Mark, Mark, Mark. We need to have <laughs> discipline. Okay, we we're have going discipline. tag team right now. We're going, going no, Lucha well, Libre. I, I take all comers. Okay? We're going Lucha Libre. Well, I'm tagging Chris before before he gets in. Well, we we're, we're going to respect that, but we're going to start with Chris. Go ahead, Chris, because you asked first. That's why I'm doing it. Yeah. So, look, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue the Hackett uh, Helton thing. I don't want to I don't want to think about those guys any more than I have to. So, <laughs> fair enough. Clay Helton is a disaster, and the people at uh, Georgia Southern or wherever he is now, they'll they'll discover soon enough. Uh, here's my issue with you, Greg, and you know what's coming. Don't give me that NCAA nonsense. Nothing was going on with Reggie Bush that wasn't happening with big time football players at every major program in the last 50 years. And you know what? Under McKay too. I'll tell you right now, football players got money when McKay was there. Of course they did. Because the NCAA rigged it where, you, where, where a black market would come into existence because these guys create revenues and don't get to share it. The simple fact of the matter is that the NCA railroaded USC in an unfair and ridiculous proceeding where they had to make up false facts that don't withstand scrutiny in order to punish USC for something that, that everybody else was doing. 
everybody, and you know it. So don't give me this nonsense about how Pete Carroll left us in bad shape. Paul D left us in bad shape. Pat Hayden left us in bad shape. There are a whole lot of people left us in bad shape. You know what Pete Carroll left us? He left us a whole lot of wins when we hadn't had any for two decades prior to that. Don't give me the Pete Carroll left us in a bad shape. You sound like a Bruin or a Domer with that sort of nonsense, Greg. You should be ashamed. And while you were right earlier when you said that we get along really well, now, ladies and gentlemen out there in, in cyberspace, right now I am irritated with Greg Katz, and that was unacceptable. Tag, you're in, Mark. Okay, I'm going to lift Greg no, up. I just wanna, Mark, you're no, gonna, no, no, Greg, no, no, Greg, you're bloody, no, say, Greg, I'm lifting Greg, you up. Mark. I'm you up. You're standing in the corner. I'm lifting you up. I'm brushing you off. I'm going to get you all nice and neat. And I, I'm. you're going to get your chance. But before you do, let me take a deep breath. So both both of okay. you are talking about how, well, you know, John Robinson, he walked into a great program. You know what? I can talk about Bear Bryant left how many coaches a strong program, but they weren't able to maintain it after the fact. John Robinson took over a program that McKay built. Absolutely. And this isn't a knock on McKay, but McKay was coaching in an era where he was storing 200 players on the, on the bench. So nobody else really had a chance. Culkin, so wait a minute, Culkin, you're using your time to try to say that John Robinson is a better coach than John McKay. I'm making Stop the that. argument. I'm making the argument that John Robinson for my argument. Yes. Yes. I thought you were going to tag team with me and beat up on. No, you did a, you, you, let them, you, you bloodied them up on the, on the whole sanction. Okay. I didn't need to All go right. there. I, okay. I'm, I'm still, I'm still upset though. Good. I so am I. I you so am I. Cause I, I, so am I, cause I don't like hypocrites. <laughs> and, and that was very hypocritical of Greg. <laughs> what? So, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I never thought you would stoop to that low. Hypocritical. Well, Greg, I'm That's, sorry. I've been called a lot of things, but not hypocritical. Now, in, in terms this, of uh, in this situation, I think you are. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, even though it's wrong. Now, the point is with Arledge, since I will get the last comment here, since he, uh, I don't know, but I, I guess we're getting close to the Oscars, so he gave an Academy Award. I thought I was watching Perry Mason, to be quite honest with you, or Law and Order, but it's easy you know, when you have the truth on your side. It's easy. Well, that's why I'm going to speak, because I do have the truth on my side. Uh, you know, the whole argument that you gave about the NCAA, and this is really for another conversation, but since you uh, brought it up, basically, to, re to try to puncture a, a, an argument. Look, Reggie Bush got in trouble because of Reggie Bush. Okay, that's the bottom line. The NCAA, yes, was draconian. Yes, Paul Drees was a complete a-hole, okay? Pardon my French. Uh, and yes, but the fact of the matter is, if it was on the freeway, and I know you'll probably say that's a stupid comment. Look, it, there's people that go, exceed the speed limit all the time. One person got doesn't mean it wasn't justified. Doesn't mean, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't arrest all the other people and give them a ticket. So really, this is really unjust. Reggie Bush brought it on himself. He gave it away. Yes, players have always been paid. I know that. You know that. But he got caught. And I tell you what annoys me. Can I tell you what annoys me? That when it came to paying the price for that, Pete Carroll left for the NFL and basically hightailed it out. And others yeah, had to yeah, pay wait, the price. Wait, 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 wait. Do you think that Carroll expected those draconian sanctions? There's no way he expected that. I don't that. care what he thought. The no. bottom line is, is he left town and the re remaining, Mark, stay away, please. I'm away. I, you just can't see my eyes rolling in the back of my head. That's all they're doing right now. I mean, fair enough. McKay never left town. So I guess, uh, oh. No, okay. he left town for a reason. And I know what the reason was. What was the reason, Greg? <laughs> the reason was. Money? Was John McKay, yes. John McKay felt he deserved a certain amount of raise and USC was not willing to pay him. He even said that to people that I have, that I know that have written books on him, where he said later, I was a big mistake that I left USC. But at the time I was, I was, I was upset that they wouldn't pay me what I thought I was worth because they were under, under evaluating my worth. And I had no choice when Hugh Culverhouse of Tampa Bay said, I'm going to do it. Uh, I had to do it. It was a no brainer situation, but I didn't want to go. 
and that is the truth of the matter. So in the interest of time, this has been a beautiful beginning. I can only wait to see where we're going from here. So let's get going. Second quarter. Panel, we start the second quarter with this. Who is the greatest quarterback of the modern USC football era? We're going to go with Chris. Who is it? It's Matt Leinert. Uh, Carson Palmer is the most talented quarterback in USC football history. Uh, big, strong, surprisingly fast, accurate, um, unbelievably skilled. Matt Leinert didn't have those skills. But Matt Leinert had the best career of any quarterback in USC football history. And frankly, I think, I think he had the best career of arguably any quarterback in college football history. I think Tommy Frazier and Tim Tebow uh, have an argument for that. But you can't argue with two national championships, a last second loss uh, uh, before he wins a third national championship in a game where he played very well and put 38 points on the board or whatever it was. Um, a Heisman Trophy winner, another Heisman Trophy uh, final uh, uh, finalist season. Uh, Matt Leinart had the greatest career of any USC quarterback, and it's not close. No. Mark, is it close? No, I can't add anything to that because um, and the other quarterback that I had was, and he touched on it, was Carson Palmer, um, and only just not because of what he did at USC, which he had, you know, one really solid year, and it wasn't even a full year. Um, but it was a Heisman Trophy season. Um, but when you combine everything that he did in the NFL and, you know, the way, you know, Chris, you know, just described the prototypical quarterback. Um, yeah, it's, you got to say Carson's right behind Matt. But Matt's, you know, Matt, Matt's mantle of trophies and accolades and everything else. Nobody can step to that. No one. Okay, what I will say about Matt Leinart is I think he is. I agree with both of you completely. Just for those of you with a quick review, he was the first junior to win the Heisman Trophy when he did so in 2004, uh, leading SC to the second national championship. He was a three-time All-America. His record is incredible, 37-2 and two as a starter. He ranks third on USC's career completions, passing yardage, and total offensive charts, and his 99 career touchdown passes set a packed uh, uh, record. Uh, he set 16 school records in his career. It is my opinion that had SC beaten Texas, he would be considered the greatest quarterback in the history of college football. He was that close. And uh, I don't care what he did in the NFL. I don't even care why he didn't do what he did in college. But hands down, this guy is a legend, legend. And uh, it's something I think we all agree upon. And since we do, now we're going to get to something we may not agree upon. Uh, it's halftime. So usually we have some sort of uh, uh, fun type of discussion, but because of the nature of the position battle here, uh, here is the big one. Who is the greatest running back of the modern USC football era? You can also give your thoughts on the fullback position as well. So, Mark, I know you come from a different time period, but in your opinion, who is the greatest running back? Or you can even use the word tailback if you wish, although sure. I'm offended in today's world using tailback by what we're seeing. But your thoughts? I won't be using scat back, that's for sure. But I, I think tailback, running back. Um, I like the way you actually posed the question to us in, in the script, Greg. So I'm going to combine it all into one. My, my running back played both positions so um, obviously Reggie Bush is probably the obvious answer for the you know most exciting tailback to ever play at USC um, but Marcus Allen uh, because he played fullback for a Heisman winner in front of him Charles White and then took over the position and became a Heisman winner himself playing the position so I gotta go Marcus one okay uh, fullback do you have a, a, a thought on a fullback? Well, again, I, I'm, I'm just going to put Marcus as the best because he okay. played fullback okay. Okay. before he became a Heisman winner at tailback. Okay. I mean, he he, he did it. He's <laughs> – I don't know how you do more than that at the positions. Okay. Let's go to the White Mamba. Are you ready to strike? I'm ready. 
strike. Mark, Mark is right. It's Marcus Allen. Um, OJ was probably the better pure runner. He was a he was a faster uh, a faster player, um, maybe even a little bit bigger than than Marcus. Although Marcus was a good side back, um, but Marcus Allen um, uh, he he wins the he wins this for a couple of reasons. Number one is his versatility. Um, not only is this a guy who rushed for over two thousand yards, the first person to do that in college football, um, but yes, he was also a fullback. Uh, slamming against uh, slamming in inside linebackers 30 times, 40 times a game uh, for Charles White, which shows both uh, uh, it, an incredible level of toughness and a dedication to being a team player. Marcus Allen was also uh, a very good pass catcher out of the backfield in a day when a, a lot of running backs were not. Um, and I don't know that he caught a ton of passes at USC. I think he became known for that more uh, in the NFL. But this is a guy who could do everything. And so, uh, and so I think the answer is Marcus Allen. Okay. Uh, you're going to go with Marcus as a fullback too? Well, Chris? no, I'm, I'm not going to give a fullback answer. <laughs> and, and the reason is, is because I think the game has changed so much that I think it's difficult. We're going to talk about this with the wide receivers in a minute, but I, I think it's, I think it's difficult, difficult to compare fullbacks from the 1960s with fullbacks from Pete Carroll's era. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to shelve that for a minute. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know where I would put Sam Bam Cunningham into the conversation. It's just, that's a hard, that's a hard one to. And probably number one, really. Right. But, but I think, but I'm you not think sure. think of him as a tailback too. Yeah. I'm not sure he's a fullback in the sense that we would think of it. So anyway, I'll, I'll leave that alone. All right. Well, once again, I, it's left to me to correct both of you. Uh, the greatest running back in the history of modern USC football, without a doubt, is O.J. Simpson. Forget about what he did as an adult. We all know what it was, but as a football player at USC, he is the greatest pure running back. He could catch the ball when he first came to SC. They actually gave him a try at a little bit of wide receiver, and then he went back to running back, and McKay said, that's the last you're going to see. Obviously, a Heisman Trophy winner like Marcus Allen, okay? Two-time All-American, okay? Uh, could he have been as versatile as Marcus Allen? Yes, he could have because he had the ability to catch the ball, but he was asked to carry the ball. He carried the ball 40 times, 45-plus times. Uh, he At the time, he established an NCAA record for yards, 1,709 in a single season. He equaled a better 19 NCAA conference and USC records. Uh, he was bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, I will say this. I have watched a lot of film on Simpson because I was 17 years old and 18 when he played. So, but I wanted to reassure myself that I wasn't seeing things. And I saw Marcus Allen. He came in as a safety. He was a good fullback, no doubt about it. Was a very good tailback. But he played on an NFL Tackle to tackle, offensive line, unbelievable offensive line. Uh, Simpson did not run behind an unbelievable offensive line. Now, when he was a junior, he had Mike Taylor and uh, Ron Yeri. Okay, two great. But his inside games, his guards were Mike Scarpe, Steve Lamer. They were not All America caliber. Uh, Dick Alm in the center was not an All America center. Not like the offensive line that. Uh, that uh, Marcus Allen had. And when Simpson was a senior, that basically that whole offensive line was gone. And it was a rebuilt offensive line. And Simpson gets the Heisman Trophy. He was unbelievable. And uh, you couldn't go wrong with Marcus Allen. You really couldn't. Uh, Reggie Bush may have been the most explosive running back in terms of quickness and moves. But I'll tell you one thing, and I, I've always said this to myself, and it's worth arguing against me, against Texas, when it was fourth and two, if O.J. Simpson had been the running back and they gave the ball to him, I guarantee you SC would be national champions today because he could make nothing. He was that strong, 6'2", 207, and even Lane Kiffin couldn't have ruined him on that call. So it's the argument as far as fullback goes, I agree with uh, you guys. Game is different, but is it really all that different? Sam Cunningham is the best fullback hands down of the modern era. 
he started, remember, he started off as a running back. He was a tailback against Alabama. He was running the ball. Uh, even in the 70s, Cunningham was making a statement. Then mostly to two. I mean, it was even uh, during the, the Carroll era, uh, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I mean, Mike Hancock, some of these other guys were really Brandon. good. Brandon, yeah, Brandon. Did I say Mike? Yeah. Sure. Now I'm listening. Mike Hancock was a tackle for USC at Ball High School. No, I, I think that uh, in the long run, Cunningham uh, was the best all around fullback, in my opinion. Uh, he was considered this. He was a blocking back, yet he made All American in 1972. During his time period, he went 24, 8, and 2 uh, and was on a national championship. All right. So let's. Be let's before we, be, before yeah. we leave this. Yeah. Sure. I was just where would we throw just real quick? Where would you throw Ricky Bell into this discussion? Ricky Bell was kind of like not the same player, but in the same situation as Marcus Allen. Started as a actually he came from Fremont as a fullback. For, no, for, forget the back. forget the accolade. Forget the for, no, no, for, I've got, for, I want to get this transition in. He played fullback uh when he came and blocked uh at USC after they moved him from linebacker. He became a tailback. There has never, in my opinion, been a tailback with that style of running. He's as close to Earl Campbell as you'll ever get in Cardinal and Green. So Ricky Bell was a great tailback. He was very good as a fullback. I don't know if that's... that's well, I was just saying you could have put him in on fourth and two instead of OJ. And we, no, I don't, I, you know, it's possible. It's not, look, it's not like Lindell was not a, was right? not an unbelievable <laughs> talent. And, and by the way, he was 250 pounds. You said, you know, OJ, 6'2", 207. Lindell was 250 pounds. I don't think he read the block very well on that play, but he was picking up seven, eight, nine yards to carry the entire second half. I fully expected them to give the ball to Lindell White, and I fully expected him to get the first down and was shocked when he did it. I that fully expected I, I fully expected Matt Weiner to complete the pass to Mike Hancock and that we wouldn't even be having this discussion. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the drop the drop of that pass in the flats on first down was a killer. Oof. Anyways, halftime's over. All right. All right. All right, guys, before we begin the second half of our special offensive edition, which I hope all of our viewers and listeners have their own opinion, can argue with us, but it's good for a reminder that you're watching or listening to WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojan Huddle. This week, we are SC panelists include Mark Culkin, Chris Arledge, and I'm Greg Katz. We encourage you to check out WeRSC.com, part of the On3 network, and become a subscriber to the best coverage of USC football and Trojans athletics. And as a bonus, here is currently a free WeRSC seven-day free trial to view our exclusive On3 Plus content, which includes analysis, breaking stories, and data for USC football and basketball, which Mark does a great job of coming, and the balance of USC athletics. All right, let's get rolling. <laughs> Panel, we begin the second half kickoff and third quarter with the question of this, and I know this is going to be controversial. Who is the greatest receiver and tight end in USC modern history? Chris, go for it. So it's difficult it's difficult to talk about wide receivers uh, from 1950 to the present because the game, the game has changed so dramatically. Um, Lynn Swan may have been as good as anybody, but if you look at his numbers, he's barely in the top 30 in, uh, in career receiving USC because the game, the game has changed so much. Realistically, you have to, you can't do from 1950 to the present when it comes to passing stats, you have to talk about from pre Bill Walsh, to post Bill Walsh, because Bill Walsh changes everything. Prior to Bill Walsh, uh, even the great quarterbacks in the NFL tend to be about one-to-one -one, uh, in terms of uh, touchdown-interception ratio. Um, uh, even the great quarterbacks are somewhere in the 50% range in terms of their passing numbers. Um, in 1979, I looked this up just to see, in 1979 in the NFL, I'm using the NFL because you, you get better statistics from the different eras. In 1979, there was one quarterback in the NFL that had a two-to-one touchdown interception ratio. That was Roger Stahl. That's it. This last year, you had 15 quarterbacks that had at least a two-to-one ratio, and some of the best guys are three, four, five-to-one. 
Um, and, and instead of completing 54, 55% of your passes, you're completing 65, 66, 67. Bill Walsh changed the game dramatically. So uh, USC had great receivers prior to that shift in football. They don't get any consideration. Lynn Swan doesn't get any consideration. He didn't catch enough balls. So if you're talking, if you're talking about the last 20 years or so of USC football, go back 25. So you include Johnny Morton, who was fantastic. Um, you're talking about a huge number of just unbelievable football players. The 10th or 11th best receiver on the list the last 25 years at USC is a great football player. Um, the best, Mike Williams. Mike Williams is the best receiver in USC history. He was absolutely freakishly dominant. He didn't even have to be open. Mike Williams could get open, but he didn't have to be open. All you had to do was throw it in the area and Mike would use his body. He'd grab the ball. Sometimes he'd grab it one handed and just hold it there. And then he'd maul some poor defensive back trying to tackle him. It was, it was the most remarkable thing I'd ever seen. I'd seen receivers that are fast. I'd seen receivers that are big. It can go up on high point to ball. I hadn't seen receivers at USC who you could throw a bubble screen to and know you're going to get nine yards because he's just going to leave cleat marks on the, on the corner's chest. <laughs> Mike Williams was unbelievable. He was Keyshawn Johnson. If Keyshawn could just run over people, he was extraordinary. And I think he's the best receiver in USC history. Well, he's certainly there. I, I think a lot of people would agree with you. Uh, is Mark Culkin one of those that would, well, before we go to Mark, do you have a tight end? Uh, okay, so here, my, my good buddy Rod McNeil would probably say that his buddy Charlie Young should be selected here. And Young was great. He was a first team All-American, played on the best college football team of all time. He was, uh, he, in the NFL, he was a rookie of the year and, and a multiple time Pro Bowl. The problem is, again, he played in a different era and Charlie Young didn't catch enough balls. So I'm going with Fred Davis, who was also a first team All-American, also won a national title. Um, and, uh, and Fred Davis uh, is USC's only Mackey Award winner. So I'm going with Fred Davis. Okay. And, and he broke Ohio State's heart by running out of town in the middle of the night, which, uh, which is even sweeter. That was pretty sweet. Uh, okay, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, what, what BMW was doing on, on the field was... It, I mean, some people might call it child abuse because that's kind of what it looked like. Um, he was just a man among boys. But I'm thinking, you know, Drake London was starting to touch that that same ceiling. And then I'm thinking, man, USC's had a lot of great receivers. And, and what if those two were on the same team? And I'm thinking that would probably be illegal. So okay. uh, just because... Chris freaking nailed it with BMW. I have to go with Drake London. And not because Chris is wrong, because he's probably right. But what Drake was approaching this past season before the injury took him out was he was going to places that nobody has ever gone before at, at that position, anywhere across the country. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to give Drake the nod only because of what could have happened. Okay, well, you know what? I think this is the least position that I feel confident about, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I have no argument, really, if you thought Mike Williams was the best. I would have no problem if you thought Keyshawn Johnson was the best. You know, if you can control a game from any position, that says a lot to me, okay? I thought Keyshawn controlled a game. Ask what ask uh, the Cotton Bowl. He's in their Hall of Fame. Okay, ask uh, you know uh, Northwestern what he thought. Um, but I'm going to say, after I really looked at this and I said, you know what, I'm going to go, and I know that you you guys won't agree with me this, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to go with Marquise Lee, a Bolitnikoff Award winner, year starter, 24 USC records including career receiving yards. He's second on USC's career receptions with 248 uh, catches. I don't recall a guy that I thought that any time he touched the ball, he was going all the way. And no, he didn't do it with brute strength like Mike Williams. Uh, and I think the play that Chris was referring to was against UCLA. 
and I, I think that uh, Mark makes a great point about Drake London. We will never know because of his injury. Uh, you know, Drake London did not have other receivers on the other side to take off the pressure. That's what makes uh, Drake London great, is that he was able to do a double team, everything. And that is something very, very special. Now, as far as a tight end goes, I'm going to have to uh, go with Charles Young. And yes, he's from another era, but when he did make catches, he made catches like a guy who was a Mackey Award winner, but they didn't have a Mackey Award in those days. So he, but what they did have was all American. Uh, I don't get too concerned about whether you're a Bolitnikoff Award winner or whatever. Uh, I look at it strictly as, um, you know, how dominant were you? Could you control a game? Uh, and Charles Young, I never forget, he made a catch against Cal where the ball was, was low to the ground and at six foot four and a half, they called him the tree for a reason. Uh, he literally looked like he was going off a high dive and, and going into a pool and he took the ball and it was remarkable. Uh, and not only that, what Fred Davis didn't have that Charles Young did, and it, it is an, uh, by nature of the eras they played in, Charles Young was a vicious blocker. I mean, he would just, he was like a tackle that could move. Fred Davis was like that era, the era of, of, of a catching a tight end, not to take anything away from him, uh, but he was really good. Uh, and by the way, SC uh, has had many great tight ends uh, that we're not talking about that certainly would be in a conversation if you wanted to go there. All right, let's go to the fourth quarter. Now, I don't know if this is going to work because I got a different background, but Chris, you can make some remarks. There it is. Okay, can you see a little bit of it? Well, we can only see the base. We actually can't see the flame right now. Yeah, we'll be able to see the torch, but There's no. Very can you, can you see it's very disappointing. Bit? We can't, I mean, I don't know. I take you know. full responsibility on this problem, but it's the thought that counts. So to all of you, we start the fourth quarter. It's the background. <laughs> People who tune in for the first time and see you do that must think this is so weird, right? They must not have any idea. Why is that guy lighting a candle that you can barely see? What is going Nobody's on? Who's going to come out with a hood and a paddle? <laughs> Thank you. I Mark was going to say, have they changed the dates of Hanukkah? But uh, apparently uh, that's not, <laughs> not true. All right. So let's go to the fourth quarter with this flame going. Uh, who is the greatest offensive lineman of the modern USC football era. Mark, who is it? And don't cop out that I wasn't born when this all happened. No, no, no. I, this, this is just a really challenging question that I don't Good. know. That's the way I want it. Yeah, I, it's, That's a compliment. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I can rattle them off, but I'm just going to – I'm not. So I'm just going to pull one. Uh, Tyron Smith. Okay. Okay. Oh for the guy was just amazing i mean he came in as a freshman he took over the position and never let it go you don't see freshmen come in and take an offensive tackle position and own it it just doesn't happen he did it and he kept getting better every single year and we know what he's done in dallas so i'm just going to cut it short there's there's just too many players to talk about so i had to pull one well, I was an era choice. I think it was an era choice that you were familiar with him. Oh, I could have uh, gone back to Tony Baselli, Anthony Munoz. Like I said, I could rattle off names for all days. the way back to Tony Baselli. Yeah, you're and Anthony Munoz, <laughs> and, and, and 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 your best friend Ron Yeri. Well, we'll get to him in a second. I, I'm sure let's we first, will. Let's first get to Chris Arledge. In your opinion, who's the greatest offensive tackle in the modern era? It's funny that this is the hardest one, but I think I think in many respects this is the hardest one. Um, USC has had so many unbelievable offensive linemen. And, and actually, one of the things that, that is really sad is that, um, uh, is that Clay Helton let this tradition down the way he did. Um, there is no right or wrong answer here. Because if you, if you were to go with a, a Yeri or a, or a Matthews, maybe, no, I don't think you can, um, uh, 
I was going to say uh, Anthony Munoz, although I don't think you can make that argument. I don't think he was healthy enough at USC. But you can make you can make an argument for a lot of guys. I'm going to say this. Nobody has been a better football player on the offensive line than Tony Baselli. There may be guys that were just as good as Tony Baselli. There were guys that, at least in the NFL, played longer than Tony Baselli did. But nobody has been a better football player on the offensive line than Tony Baselli. That guy was an absolute monster. He did, he did not make mistakes. He did not give up sacks. He did not give up pressures. He did not hold. He did not false start. He simply dominated every single play, every single game, every single year he played. Tony Baselli is my guy. Well, I think both of them were outstanding picks for different reasons. I think uh, the thing about Baselli and probably Tyron Smith is they didn't play on national championship teams, which seems to, you know, you know, on, honestly provide a little bit more glitter to somebody's resume. But needless to say, it's just sensational players, and I don't think you could go wrong with either one of them. Uh, obviously, as Mark alluded to, I, I'm going to go with Ron Yeri. Uh, I saw the thing that I like in making this pick, honestly speaking, is I, I saw them practice. I saw Ron Yeri practice. I saw these guys, you know, forget about what they did in the NFL as college players. And Ron Yeri, to me, was, he was in a world of his own. Uh, what he did on a football field, I, what he did to Indiana in the Rose Bowl, guys would get arrested for. <laughs> they, I mean, you talk about collapsing a whole side of a line. The thing about Yeri was, he had Tony Baselli's nastiness. And people forget there's great tackles that aren't necessarily nasty. They're great technicians, but they're not nasty. Ron Yeri was nasty. Remember, he came to SC at one time. He was a defensive tackle uh, coming out of Cerritos uh, in the days of the old both ways. And when they, when they put him on the offensive line, he's SC's only Outland Trophy winner. Now, I think that's BS because I can't believe with all the other great linemen they've had that somebody else wasn't an outland. I mean, we know that the Lombardi Award went to Brad Buddy, okay? Uh, I, Brad Buddy, to me, if you're just looking at college, he takes a back seat to nobody, Tyron Smith, any of them. For college, he was a beast. But I'm going to go with Ron. Uh, and remember, he was also uh, the first player picked in the 1968 NFL draft. Uh, so this was a hard one. I think Chris is right. This was, this was a hard one because there's been so many great ones, but I'm going with, uh, the pride of, uh, Bellflower High School in, uh, Ron Yeri. So with that said, now to a very popular, God, that bell sounded bad. That's yeah, much better. I feel like I'm at Canners. Um, over time, it's time to answer our viewer questions in a free-for-all answer format, all right? Uh, for those of you that are listeners or viewers, if you'd like to submit a question that we can answer here on Inside the Trojan Settle, just go to either the Gary P. or the WeRSC members message boards. From there, you'll see the topic thread regarding questions for Inside the Trojan Settle. Now to questions, guys, feel free to ch chime in if you see this. All right, our first question is from Alta Loma Trojan in Alta Loma, California. CLR, I think that means Coach Lincoln Riley, seems to have the same charisma, press, it factor as Carol Vay, Pat Riley. He seems to fit the LA Hollywood image, same as ex-QBs Leinert and Sanchez. Winning games and an NC is the bottom line at USC, no matter who does it. But how important or what advantage is it to have the LA image whose personality can shine on a big stage, especially for the coach at USC. Compare that to Fickle or Campbell, who seem to have the Midwest football coach image, or, or Chip Kelly that has the, quote, I'm not so sure what to call it image. Guys, uh, take that uh, question here from Alta Loma Trojan. Take it where you want. Uh, anybody want to volunteer first? I'll jump in. I, I, actually, okay. I actually dispute the premise. Um, I think if you were going to, if you're going to make a movie, hey, we're close to Hollywood at USC. If you're going to make a movie and you want to star a, uh, a college football coach, I think you probably put Luke Fickle in the role. That guy looks and sounds and acts like a football coach. Lincoln Riley doesn't look like a football coach, nor does he look like a movie star. 
he looks like he looks like he could easily be an accountant and uh, or a lawyer or whatever. I mean, he's this idea that that he's got this incredible charisma, this incredible presence. I don't see that at all. What he has is an unbelievable football mind, and he's a fantastic recruiter because he really works at it and really makes a connection with kids. Those are the two, those are the two things he brings to the table. But he doesn't, he doesn't look like a stereotypical football coach, nor does he look like George Clooney. I don't know what I don't I don't understand. I don't understand why people are are are, are acting otherwise. He doesn't look like Pat Riley. Pat Riley had that. I mean, Pat Riley was was fashionable with the suits and all the rest of it. It's not Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley is a super smart football coach who does a great job recruiting. I'm thrilled to death to have him. So do I think that matters? No, I don't think it matters at all because I don't think Lincoln Riley has that. I think Lincoln Riley is just a fantastic football coach. And that's what USC needs. Yeah, I, I, I think what gets conflated is, you know, Lincoln Riley's young. And, you know, he, he's aggressive and he's, he's a little brash. He's not, you know, he's not totally out there. So maybe that's it's not, Kiffin, it's not Lane Kiffin brash. No, nowhere close to Lane Kiffin. Yeah. No, Is no, anybody no, no, no. Lane Kiffin brash? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> so I guess the question would be, you know, does it matter? I don't think so because Nick Saban doesn't check any of those boxes. And I think he'd be able to step right into Hollywood and, and, and probably win this year. And, He's not the most, you know, media savvy or friendly person. He's, let me refer, he's very media savvy. He's not media friendly. Um, that's still, to, still uh, to be determined where Lincoln Riley falls as far as that goes. So, yeah, I don't think it matters. Well, I, I'm not nearly the movie buff that Chris is, but if I had someone playing the part of uh, Lincoln Riley, I think I'd go with Gary Cooper. Uh, for those of you that, I've ever heard of Gary Cooper at this point in time, but uh, that would be my choice. Uh, I think perception is reality. I think that just your name, Lincoln Riley, there's something about having Lincoln as your first name that automatically sparks some sort of respect and reverence. Um, I don't think any of us know how he's going to play out in Los Angeles. Uh, I agree that he's a, you know, by all accounts, a great offensive football mind. Uh, the, the only I tell you, the, the, of all the coaches I've seen in my lifetime at SC, like I said, royalty, John McKay, uh, celebrity, Pete Carroll. Nobody will ever match Pete Carroll in terms of work in the room. Uh, John McKay was good for one liners, but this guy, Pete Carroll, he was he could have been a, on anything. He could have been anything, even a, a lawyer, I think, at some point in time. Uh, so I think that would have been. <laughs> you know, I tell you, if I could have a, a dream, it would be you arguing your case against Pete Carroll. That I would, I think that would be a pay per view type of situation. Um, all right, let's go to question number two from the Lizard King from Minneapolis, Burr, Minnesota. Predict the Trojans' record for 2022 and what bowl they play in. All right, who's on deck? Uh, I'm going to go 10 and two and they're going to play Oklahoma in the Rose bowl in the Rose bowl. Okay. Chris. Yeah. I, I didn't have the Oklahoma prediction, but I was, I was also going to go 10 and two and, uh, and Rose bowl. I think that's, uh, I think that's about right this year. I'm not saying, I, I just think God has a funny sense of humor and he's going to make that happen. I guess I would have to be 11 and two um, realistically, but um, 10 and two regular season, I think. Well, I think they'll go uh, ten and two. I actually, if they think if the wind blew just right, maybe you know one loss this season, maybe nine and three is a little bit more of a possibility. But I'm willing to to spend some uh, cachet here with uh, ten and two. I think they'll face Oklahoma. I'm just not sure whether it's going to be the Rose Bowl or it's going to be the Alamo Bowl. But either way. It doesn't make a difference what venue it's going to be. It's going to be nasty. I can be the highest, that it's, it will it's, be the highest rated game on TV, period. It's, it's going to be a bloodbath. And that's just the fans in the stands. I mean, it's, it's going to be, you better have some security around you, whatever colors you're wearing uh, to go to those games. So I think we're all basically saying it's going to be a very, we expect a very good record and a good bowl game. 
Uh, I, think, I think that I think there will be a big turnout from OU because I bet they'll leave, they'll even loosen the parole rules in uh, in OU <laughs> to to let more of their fan base out. I you know what you know what scares me is that both of you guys are marked individuals. Uh, in the eyes of Sooner fans, and I am not going to walk close behind you, either one of you. I haven't even, even started yet. I I'm not even, even that far away. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm not even that far away from Oklahoma, yet I'm that confident that they can't actually find me, despite the fact that they know my name and, and I have a presence <laughs> online. I still don't think they can find me. That's, Chris, that's, that's just in the nature of OU fans. Chris, at the, at the, at the State Fair... When 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 the the Red River shootout, where's the best yeah. place to find Oklahoma Sooner fan? Where's the best place to go? I, I don't know. Where what's the best place to go? I'm asking because I'm. Oh, I thought it was a joke, Mark. I thought no. you were telling a joke. <laughs> no, no, I'm asking you to tell me so I go out there and do a little, you know set up shop and maybe you know change my mind. Why I are you? You can. I think you can find them everywhere there. I mean, half of the people there are OU fans. I thought. I'm disappointed. I thought I thought no, we were going to get a great OU joke, no, and instead no. it was an honest request. I want to go set up. A, I want to go set up shop with a little, you know, change my mind. I tell you what, Mark, you go to the Red River shootout. You go to you go to the fair, and if you can't find any OU fans, you call me, and I will drive down and help you. I suspect you'll be able to run into one or two, maybe even a couple that aren't drunk, but probably not. <laughs> Question three. From Boz in Las Vegas, which running backs who are likely to be on the roster in September are going to be outstanding for us other than those in slots? I see nothing on Huddle to make me happy. I assume Huddle must be the highlight uh, yes. a company that, that shows the highlights that we all like to watch. Uh, thoughts, guys? Um, I'm assuming when he says in slots, he's referring to Rayleigh Brown. I would think so. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what Lincoln Riley and this offense does in the spring. I, this is just a question that's just, you know, we, we know that Die and, and Austin Jones came here to be, you know, feature backs. You still got um, Barlow and Brandon Campbell. So let, let's spring camp. I We heard might start on March 20th. Um, I, those are your running backs. Travis dies probably like I, I think someone said in the beginning of the show is probably going to get the first touch when the ball's handed off. I, I'm actually a little bewildered by the question. If, yeah, if this question had been asked um, a couple of months ago when we were down to two backs, neither one of which was really proven, then I would say, yeah, we have some concerns. Um, but when you have when you have the two transfers come in, including Die, who I believe led the conference in yards from scrimmage last year, and was a strong candidate for offensive player of the year in the conference, I, I don't understand the problem. I mean, if if that guy plays if that guy plays every down, he's going to rush for seventeen hundred yards and he's going to score seventeen touchdowns. I, I'm okay with that. I don't understand what the problem is. USC's running back room right now is pretty strong. No, they don't have they don't have an elite talent that's going to that's going to that's going to become an NFL Pro Bowler. I don't think, but they have a lot of guys that have been productive now, and um, and, and I think they have a, a leader in that room who's uh, who's a stud. And Rayleigh Brown, while he may be in the slot a lot, that's a guy who's going to get touches from the backfield and is going to be electric. I don't see the problem. I'm excited about the running back room. I, I agree with Chris. I think that if you're only looking at the huddle highlights, you're looking at high school players, basically. And SC's got players that are not high school players. You go look at the Oregon Duck highlights with Die running the ball. Go look at uh, uh, the Stanford highlights and, and, and see uh, the running back from Stanford's highlights. Uh, I, I think they're actually in decent shape with the addition of the two uh, Pac-12 transfers, so I, I'm okay with that. Um, question from uh, SC 1952 in West LA. Any new info on hiring an assistant coach for a quarterback? Seems like a good move to help uh, Coach Lincoln Riley. Any thoughts on that? Anybody heard any rumors on that? Nothing. I'm still waiting to be introduced to uh, wide receivers coach Dave Nichols. Yeah. Yeah. What about Nichols? Does anybody We're have a defining? I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot off an email to uh, 
USA see if there's any update, but right now, no, nothing's been. Okay. We were told he was going to be made up, you know, we would get, he would be made available to us soon. And that was the day that we were introduced to all the assistant coaches. All right, here's a question uh, from Pac uh, Trojan. Has anyone in the media asked Coach Riley how he's going to approach special teams play during games and practice since no one has been identified as special teams coordinator coach? Do you think this lack of interest by the coaches to special teams could come back and bite the team in a close game? Well, lack of interest, that, that's based on what exactly? I mean, the fact that he doesn't have a designated special teams coach, uh, I, I think what that means is they're going to divide up the duties amongst a lot of the assistant coaches, which is not unheard of in college football. Um, and uh, is that the right approach? I don't know, but uh, that's happened before and, and teams have been successful with it. The idea that Lincoln Riley's not interested in special teams, I don't know where that comes from. I suspect he is. Lincoln Riley knows more about football than I do, and I and I know that special teams are critical, so I suspect he does too. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the uh, so the underlying assumption in the question I think is probably false. Now, if we get into the season and the special teams are a disaster every week, then maybe we can start talking about this. But until then, I don't I don't know what that's based on. Mark. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with this. I was going to go with this, where Chris just said at the very end there. Um, you know, if if, the, if they're playing a lot of close games throughout the season, which is, you know, very possible, um, and special teams become critical and they're not performing, sure, you know, we can start putting Lincoln Riley and the way he put his staff together under the microscope and say, hey, you know what, maybe a dedicated special teams coach would have been, be would have been better. But that's just hindsight before it even happened, so. We, we don't know yet. All right, question six from uh, Adelitas TJ. Any rumors or ideas about facility upgrades, possible locations for building sites, et cetera? What have you heard or have you heard of anything? No, I, I mean, they're tearing down floor tower. That was, you know, kind of announced recently. So I guess there's a potential space for more facilities. Um, I've always liked, I floated the idea before that uh, you take, um, the intramural field right out in front of the McKay Center and you start building up, start leveling up and, and kind of, you know, modernize it that way. And you can even go underground and, and, and you can expand the facilities as well. Um, I, I heard from uh, stuff with recruits that they're being told that SC is going to build a indoor practice facility uh, and that the plans are already there and they're just not sure exactly where it's going to be. So maybe it is going to be, I, I, I would have a hard time believing they put it in front of the McKay Center, but with the, and then I said, well, what about the Fleur Tower? And I said, well, that's kind of far away from practice, really. Uh, maybe behind the McKay Center. I don't know. I can't remember what's behind the McKay Center. Uh, Mark, it, remember well, there's just a, there's just like, it's kind of like an access road that, that separates the McKay Center from the cinema, cinematics building. Um, they're movie studios, I guess, is what you would call could it. You, could you build a practice field there? No, not in that area. No, that's what I'm saying. You leave that walkway be, where the McKay statue is. You kind of maybe build a, a, a walkover tunnel so people can still have their access to Heritage Hall. Maybe just start building up and down on top of, what is that, Brittingham, I think is what it is. The, yeah, uh, Brittingham. Uh -huh. yeah. in between the track stadium and then you obviously to the west you've got uh, howard jones field so you've got limited space so that's one thing you kind of have to maybe go up and down and underneath and sideways for those indoor facilities all right uh this is gonna be the last question and it's probably gonna be a very quick uh answer but this is from sc or mc for sc any thoughts on scheduling some kind of dinner get together for the future for we are SC subscribers or members? I remember the recruiting dinners with Gary and more recently dinners with the San Fernando Valley Trojan Club that Gary and JJ would attend and sometimes Arbo before Gary passed and the school did away with the alumni clubs. They were the best. I'm sure there would be a lot of interest in hearing old Gary stories and uh, USC stories in general besides talking about current times. Uh, maybe one uh, evening this summer. Uh, I will chime in on this briefly. Uh, Eric, uh, 
Uh, McKinney has talked about doing something in the future. Uh, I have, I'm sure that most of you have been to Gary's uh, very popular and successful dinners. Uh, it would be something that I think would uh, warrant conversation in the future. Uh, any thoughts from you guys before we wrap it up? I think it's a great where, idea. If we do it, I'll show up. When and where? That's all I need to know. Well, it's something I can just tell the listeners and viewers that uh, that Eric has talked about. But I think uh, you know it takes a little bit of planning, finding the right location, and uh, I can tell you it's not a dead issue. Let's just put it that way. So it'll happen soon. It'll happen. That's, that's where the Oklahoma fans will find me, Greg. Is at that dinner. We yeah, should I probably. Think you you should probably have to read something like one of those one of those books, the beginners books that the third graders have to read. Um, you know, see man run. You should probably have to read that out loud to get in, just to keep out the riffraff. I don't want to be attacked by any OU fans. Well, you know, I think, and this I think is appropriate to end this conversation, that if we had both you and Culkin signing autographs, Chris, you can give away the Chris Arledge doll bobblehead doll uh i think would be an exciting feature and mark uh you know maybe uh, you or eric uh could give away the sooner schooner uh, bobblehead wheels coming off i think that would be a big hit for those ou fans that would be in attendance yes Chris. And you could and you could sign pictures of paul d and give those away since you seem to be on the same page with paul d regarding the sanctions no. so that'll be perfect we're all we, we all have something we can give to the people and you know on that note it's a win-win-win situation for everybody. Uh, just a reminder for those of you, uh, if you have a question for our panel, go to either the We Are SC message boards and click on the thread that pertains to inside the Trojans Huddle viewer or listening questions. Here's a reminder that next Tuesday, we'll give you our opinions on the greatest defensive players position by position of the modern USC football era. We hope you enjoy the offensive discussion. So that's a wrap for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. A big thank you to this week's panel of Mark Culkin and Chris Arledge. And a big thank you to all of you for watching or listening to Inside the Trojans Huddle. So uh, until next Tuesday, this is your host, Greg Katz, reminding you to fight on, everybody.